Hello, everybody. Hi. My name is Joshua Psana. Um, I'm a reporter at Politico Europe, based in Berlin most of the time. Uh, I see that I haven't lost the two ministers in the hall there. Hi, uh, guys. Thank you for joining us today. We have a very interesting but rather short discussion uh, for you this afternoon about well, the rifts, I think, a lot on the conversations we've had earlier on today, uh, Europe's competitiveness, how to, to maintain um, the position of Central Europe's economies over the next few years. This one will focus specifically on the automotive sector uh, and innovation. We'll look specifically at Poland, to my left, with a Minister of Finance, Jerzy Kwaczynski. And to my right, we have his uh, Slovak counterpart, Ladislav Kamenitsky. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining. It's great to have well, you here. The first question, I guess, would be to the Slovak member of the panel to say, in the automotive sector at the moment, clearly a very important sector for the Slovak economy, you have this profound change in electrification, automation, um, many questions about how you can maintain the competitiveness within the EU at the moment when there are other big countries that are willing to host major car production plants. What for you are the key challenges, but also the opportunities in the transition in the industry? First of all, uh, welcome and I would like to explain how important the automotive industry uh, for Slovakia is. Uh, really, automotive industry, we are the biggest car producer per capita in the world. Almost 40% uh, of uh, whole production, uh, manufacturing production in Slovakia uh, be, uh, belongs to the automotive in the industry. And uh, what is uh, surely the most important industry uh, in, in our country. Uh, we are a very open economy, even more open than, uh, uh, than Slovenia, as uh, was told here. Uh, my colleague uh, told, told about 85% uh, in, of export on GDP. In Slovakia, this is 97%. So really one, one of the openest uh, economy in the world. Uh, so we are depending on our partners, mainly the, the Germany. Uh, our export to Germany uh, shares about 22%. Uh, this is uh, the biggest uh, importer of our products. And if uh, the German economy is facing some, some problems, then Slovakia faces the same problems. Uh, our growth uh, declined this year. Uh, uh, from 4.5% to 2.4% uh, by two, two, two uh, percentage points. And uh, this is really a very serious, uh, how to say, uh, uh, sign for Slovakia that we should do something. Uh, as you said, the automotive industry is in transformation. And um, really, I see the, uh, in the future, completely different landscape for automotive industry. Uh, I'm, as everybody in Slovakia is afraid what will be if the automotive industry will not be in the Slovakia. Really, because uh, changes uh, like uh, to change the manufacturing to the electric cars, uh, to some other hybrids, hybrid cars, uh, we, we will face that, uh, for example, electric car, car has... Uh, from five times uh, uh, to ten times less parts as the normal uh, combustion engine uh, car. This is really very important. Slovakia is on the in the uh, production chain on the uh, on the end. That is uh, on one on one hand is uh, uh, is uh, good in comparison, for example, with uh, with Hungary. Uh, Hungary will face uh, even uh, more. Uh, problems because uh, they uh, uh, they make the the engines mainly mm. mainly the uh, the combustion engines and uh, we so the, also the electric cars uh, uh, should be completed somewhere that uh, that's the advantage of, of Slovakia. Uh, what will be the future? How I see the future of the automotive industry? I, I see uh, mainly that uh, the cars will be electrified that uh, will be one, one day will be autonomous, then shared, and uh, connected each, with each other. Uh, in my imagination, I click on my app, 
some autonomous car will come to my home, I will come in, and then I will drive somewhere without any uh, collision with other car. That is uh, maybe the future. But until we come to that, uh, in 2040, uh, according to some anal analysis, uh, uh, there will be the tech, uh, some uh, uh, batteries will be in 30% of cars, uh, probably hydrogen 23% of cars, and combustion will be only 23%. Uh, percent. That is really something that will move this whole, whole industry to the new world. This will be completely new landscape. And we, we are really afraid because uh, also assembly of these cars will be much, e uh, much easier. And I don't expect, uh, according my uh, communication and negotiation with uh, also the leaders of the car uh, manufacturers in Slovakia, uh, they will, I'm very skeptic, they will not move the research and development to Slovakia. Really, the, this is the, uh, they are focused on research and development home, uh, and they will not change it. This is, uh, this is uh, naive to, to think about in this way. Uh, where we can we can uh, be competitive, maybe in so if some suppliers will will develop some some new uh, innovations. And uh, what is good that uh, uh, from 20, 20 uh, most innovative companies, only five of them are manufacturers of yeah. cars, uh, and in the first ten is no one of them of the manufacturers. That is uh, uh, maybe the uh, opportunity you are talking about. Also, in for uh, for Slovakia, the opportunity is to how to say uh, to build up the new factory mm. for the batteries. Uh, and th this is something that Maro Shevkovic last year at Globe yeah. was talking about very clearly. Yeah, yeah. We had one one company. I don't know the guys, but uh, it's called Innobat, and they are trying uh, trying to develop the battery. Uh, also, to they will try to produce the batteries and also also uh, make some pro process of recycling of the batteries. This is really very very, uh, very important. Uh, batteries are very sensitive for transportation. And they, uh, it will be needed if uh, we would like to have the automotive industry in Slovakia yeah. to have the factory near the manufacturing the factory. And have, have the whole supply chain. I mean, wh what you're talking about, the, the fundamental realignment of the whole industry means going right back along the supply chain and in a way reappraising what is necessary. And ultimately, as you say, battery production will mean fewer jobs than internal combustion engine yeah. production. I mean, Poland has a different situation if we travel a few kilometers past the mountains there. But and nevertheless, the automotive industry does play a role and batteries are a big role, right? You know, we have a lot of similarities uh, between our countries and also between the countries uh, of the regions. Uh, the countries of our regions, they have very, very strong uh, industrial sector. So I would say uh, on average, uh, the industrial sector contributes about one quarter to, you know, to, to our uh, economy, which is by about uh, 10 percentage point higher than, th than the average uh, in the EU. And uh, some years ago, we very strongly opposed, uh, you know, such a tendency in the European Union to forget industrial policy. And that was, be, you know, because uh, be before the last, the last crisis. And in fact, the crisis showed that the countries with higher and stronger industrial sector, that is not only us, that is, for example, also Germany, they, uh, and they could manage much better to tackle the problems you know, of, uh, of, the, of the crisis. So, uh, and uh, you know, as a result uh, of that, uh, we voiced this problem very broadly you know, on the European scene. And, and, and as a result, the, the European Commission prepared, uh, you know, a document called Industrial Strategy, in which uh, we in Europe we are calling for stronger industrial uh, strategy. And of course, automotive sector is the strongest, uh, you know, of all the uh, segments of the, of the of the industrial sector, and uh, and it is especially strong, of course, in our regions. But, 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 you know, we have differences. Of course, you know that uh, Slovakia is, uh, is the strongest uh, country when you, uh, when you compare automotive sector per capita, 
per GDP, mm. you know, uh, whatever. We are not so much dependent on that. In our case, automotive sector contributes some 11, 12 percent, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the industrial output. And also, so we have a different situation in the, in the sector. We have, say, less such big players who have got uh, big assembly lines. We very much rely on, on uh, small, medium-sized uh, enterprises, mm -hmm. and we've got, you know, thousands of them. So by that, we are the second biggest uh, producer of uh, automotive components and automotive parts in Europe after Germany. So that means, you know, that these companies, they usually supply with these parts of components, you know, not one car manufacturer, but, you know, a number, you know, a number of them. And, and of course, there, there, are, uh, there are huge challenges now. One is, of course, trade, trade war in the West, which, you know, since, since two years uh, uh, has affected uh, and substantially aff affected uh, the sector. Uh, there is also a big challenge related to electromobility. I wouldn't call it electrification, because if you say electrification in our region, you know what, what comes to our mind is the beginning of trend we sent we, you know, when we were electrifying, you know, our, our cities, our, mm. our villages. So it doesn't sound uh, uh, properly, you know. But in, in a way, the, f the very first cars were electric, right? Exactly. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. The, the first ones were, you know, were, were electric, or they were using steam power, not and not, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, if you want, uh, and you could drive them over 100 kilometers per yeah. hour. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, you know. However, here, of course, the big challenge is with electromobility, and this is not only because of the uh, vehicle, but this what my colleague, uh, uh, you know, has said. Uh, and, and uh, which will be a tremendous change. Uh, an electric car requires six to uh, 800 parts. And, mm. and normal car, I mean, whether diesel uh, or petrol engine, uh, it, it requires uh, usually more. five, six, you know, 6,000. So, f you know, a few times more. So it's quite obvious that, that you know, there will be much uh, less work needed, you know, for, for the production. Yeah. Also, there is another very interesting feature that you know when when you look at at the cost of different components. So, so battery at least at the moment accounts for about one third, yeah. thirty to forty percent of the value of you know of the car. So, so I would say at the moment the biggest value added is not with engine, it's not with some parts, but it's with you know, with, with batteries. So I, I would say if you compare automotive sector in, you know, in our countries, uh, we are much more dispersed. We have much more uh, players mm. and they supply many manufacturers, not only German. Uh, but, but it's uh, nevertheless an important component of the Polish of economy, course. although not, not dominant, as you say. Of course, of course. And, and, uh, and also, we are very much interested, yeah. as you wanted to say, in electrifying our automotive sector. Mm. So, so, th so this, is, uh, this is what we uh, said, uh, what we declared as our priority for the next year, to become a producer, and it will be much more easy to produce brand new uh, uh, electric yeah. cars, you know, than, than to get to the current very established market. Then, the, then, of course, in the, in, the, in the medium term, we also have to answer the questions around where does that power come from? If it's coal production, uh, power production, is it cleaning up the electric vehicle fleet? But I guess that, that's a different conversation for a different day. But you, if you just want to return to it. No, but, but you know what is interesting? Because... Uh, you know, if you compare Europe, United States, and China, you probably know you know know this figure. Mm. The highest number of new electric cars is not bought in in Europe, but is in China, mm -hmm. about four percent. In Europe, on average, it's almost two percent. Yeah. You know, in the United States, it's even less, yeah. le less than what you know than the, the one point uh, five. But it's changing. In the case of Norway, that is about one third. Uh, so, you know, this will change over time and we, we shouldn't forget that this will happen. I would yeah. compare that to the revolution in, in photocameras. I mean, every, 
almost everybody of us are using cameras. And, you know, in the past we thought that the digital cameras would stay forever. Yeah. And there was also such a company called Kodak, you may remember. Of course, but, but this, yeah, exactly. <laughs> as, as you said, you might remember because I guess technology moves on and, yeah. and if you don't continue to innovate, then, then you lose market prominence. But I just wanted to, to return to what you said a few minutes ago about the industrial strategy because at the moment with the, the discussion over the new European Commission, there's a big debate over how Europe will steer that in the future and arguably the person that would have been responsible for doing so has been rejected by uh, MEP. So it's very unclear what kind of role Brussels will play in the future on promoting an industrial strategy. However, maybe for you guys it's interesting to, to ask whether or not you think the onus is on the European Union to set an agenda for a Euro industrial strategy or whether or not you think locally and nationally you need to set up innovation programs and funding programs for, for the next small and medium suppliers that are going to fulfill orders for electric car companies. What, what do you think? I think uh, what the was mentioned uh, already here more, more of, of the times, uh, really for innovation and research and development, you need uh, very, uh, how to say, the money that are able to take some, uh, some kind of risk. And this is uh, really something that we are missing in Europe. Mm -hmm. If you take, uh, if you take uh, the situation in the US, uh, most, uh, almost 70% investments are financed by, uh, by the financial market and maybe 30 only by the banks. In, Slova in Slovakia and Europe, it's vice versa. And if uh, I met many people that have really uh, innovative ideas and they cannot, how to say, implement it because they cannot find uh, anybody who, who would like to take the risk. They are coming to the banks, and banks are uh, telling them, no, there is a too, the risk is too high, and we will not give you any, any funds and any sources. And uh, that's uh, maybe the role of state, but sto state uh, couldn't, uh, how to say, play this uh, uh, main role. And we have to find some, uh, some uh, or create the capital market that will, uh, will enable these uh, inventors uh, to raise the capital and to make these uh, ideas come true. And the problem is that all these ideas are moving uh, over the ocean and they are buying these ideas and they are, produ they are making this true and, and uh, coming true. And now we see uh, what is uh, the result. All the main uh, innovative companies are almost uh, outside outside europe that is the not not good uh, and they are rising and they are globali glo uh, globally influencing everything uh, if you take the gafa yes google amazon apple and <coughs> <coughs> what, what else F facebook they are really influencing everything and uh, i was at one interesting uh, what to say uh, th there was a meeting with uh, one guy uh, called uh, Mr. Riddle, maybe you, you know him, he's, he's futurist. And he was uh, talking about the system of uh, that these companies are already buying uh, the, the stores, they are selling the goods, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, uh, um, for real, not, mm -hmm. not only uh, electronically. Yeah. That's, that's the trend that will come. And th these uh, companies will influence everything, and that is that is really main threat. Wha for th uh, the question, what you what you asking me, uh, really for innovations, for new ideas, we need the capital that is able to take risk and uh, fast decisions. We were speaking about capital market union. Really, in the European Union, we talk about it uh, maybe seven years, and without no result. Mm. And. I'm, we are meeting with the ministers at the ECOFIN and really, uh, really, uh, I, I, I just, uh, uh, sometimes I laugh because uh, we are not mo moving forward, uh, no one step, you know, no one centimeter. And that's, I see the problem that decision take, ta taking decision within European Union is really, uh, really very, very hard. And if uh, we uh, come to some agreement, it really takes the years. And if you compare it with for example, uh, US or Canada, they decide quite fast, yeah. and you come to China, one man will say, and that's it. And uh, that's uh, uh, how we can compete in this environment, uh, and if, even if we don't have the money to realize the new innovations. That is really a problem that I see. 
But, but you guys were both there together with all of your, your finance minister colleagues uh, the last few days in Luxembourg. Is this an argument that you put to, to your colleagues very clearly? And you're saying that maybe they, they understand, but they just they don't have the political will to push forward with this kind of, this kind of policy quickly? What's no. your opinion? I, I think there are so many obstacles for that. And, uh, you know, uh, Europe is, is pretty stable, but reacts very, very slowly. So I, I wouldn't expect that we will manage, uh, you know, to, to change it uh, v very quickly. Uh, you know, I if you look at the services sector, we have no uh, services sector in Europe. Mm -hmm. It disperses over the country. If you want to introduce something, you have to meet the criteria of each individual country. We are saying in Europe that we have freedom of, of services, but this is not true. The most typical example is the last case of of transport services, uh, you know, in Europe. This is, you know, this is why many businesses, which are really fastly growing, and in, in, if they have no opportunity to access financing in the United States and immediately to have access to 350 million people, and then if they were to to bother with 27 or 28 you know, members with legislation of each part particular countries. You know, they go there. So, so I, f I, I fully agree, right. you, you know, we, with that, uh, that, that this is that this is very big uh, uh, problem. You know, the level, the level of financing, of risk financing in Europe is, I would say, really very low. Mm. So, so, I mean, and of course there is a different culture for that. Yeah. I would say, in the past, when we had such a heavy, good cows, that was good. I mean, cows like this big <laughs> manufacturing, you know, you, you know, companies, they, because they required steady, good capital, banks were happy, and so on. But, you know, in, now in a world where you have company and you don't know whether it's worth one million or one billion, and one billion innovation and it comes to you and and it requires you know give me 50 million yeah. euro you know i just we're, we're racing out of time very very sadly i just wanted to open the floor and see if maybe somebody one person probably we only have time for has a very quick question uh for the two ministers we have otherwise i will hog all of the time yes okay i get the final question after all <laughs> so I would like to know from you two, bearing in mind that you're obviously not very happy with, with the situation overall, and you've been very clear about your fear for the future with the Slovak auto industry, would you consider teaming up and both putting cash into projects? I say this because France and Germany have uh, putting, both um, countries are putting state cash into a battery venture. Uh, would Poland and Slovakia consider doing the same thing, bigger in scale? Um, it's really a question of, uh, it's not, not an easy question for me, um, really, but I, but I think uh, if we are able to do the project, you know, uh, there were more investors that would like to do the, some battery factory in Slovakia. There was also the Chinese companies, they're not only, and also we sp I spoke uh, also to, uh, I will not concrete, <laughs> to tell the concrete, but also the French companies are interesting in, uh, how to say, uh, developing the battery. They are do already doing this, uh, as you said. Uh, for me, it's impo more important that uh, uh, our automotive I industry will be diversified, that will be, we will be, uh, interesting for our uh, um, manufacturers that we, we have to think what they think about us, really, if the productivity is enough in Slovakia, if the condition stability is good for them, uh, otherwise uh, they, will, they will move somewhere and uh, this is really, and if we have our own battery factory that will help us uh, to keep them in Slovakia and we will, uh, really, we are not happy about the situation that we are really monothematic uh, oriented industry, mm. but, uh, but the automotive industry helped us in transformation process also in the gaining the, the growth of, uh, that we have today. That's mm. really important for us. And just some final uh, few words? Uh, you know, on, on that, we are in. So Poland is a part of Battery Alliance. I think this is a good project. It requires, uh, you know, legal support from the EU because it's clear state aid uh, from that, that and that is what, what's going on now. So, of course, we are in and we are very much interested. And I think there should be much more cases like that. I mean, the other areas which we, which we are really very bad now in comparison to the world is 5G technology. 
you know, uh, for example, or artificial, you know, intelligence. Mm. If you want to make uh, a change, you really have to invest, and not in the such an invest that you declare it's fine to invest but yeah. you have to create mechanisms for that. It is not only a mobility revolution going on at the moment. Yes. So yeah. thank you very much for your time, both of you. This was very great, albeit short, uh, conversation. If you could join me in thanking both of our ministers for joining us today. Thank you. And now I hand the reins over to Alex from Globesec, who has a very interesting Tatra talk on how tech is shaping our world. Alex. Thank you, Josh. And while everyone is moving and shifting, it is my pleasure to introduce the last plenary session of the day. Uh, we listened to the ministers discussing the transformation of Central and Eastern Europe against the backdrop um, of the unfolding fourth industrial revolution. And now we switch to someone who's using tech for the greater good, uh, because we talk about competitiveness, um, and that means that inclusiveness is a part of it. The next half hour, you will listen to the inspirational story of our youngest speaker so far at Tatra Summit, uh, the founder of the Ability app, Alexander Knoll. Alex started his um, entrepreneurial adventure when he was nine. He featured um, in The Allen Show, and now at 14, he's speaking at various conferences around the world while continuing to work on the Ability app. The app uh, mission is to promote accessibility and inclusiveness around the world the app will help people with disabilities and their care caregivers search for specific accessibility features, services, and employment. That means wheelchair ramps, braille signs, and menus, assistive technology for people with hearing impairments, and wheelchairs sitting at businesses and locations throughout the world. Alex, the floor is yours for the next 20 minutes. Then we will take questions and answers for about 10 minutes from the room. And then at the very end, um, I will give you some guidance on the next uh, part of our program, um, the focus group. So, Alex, the floor is yours. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. I'm very excited to speak with all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Transformation. Nearly everyone here in this room is in the business of transformation. As leaders in governance and industry, you are transforming the lives of others through policy and decision-making skills. I too am in the business of transformation. Today, I would like to share with you what I'm doing to transform the lives of people with disabilities. But first, I'd like to tell you a story about my friend Emily. Emily, like all of you here in this room, is a person who loves to travel. Emily is also a wheelchair user. One day, she recently traveled across the United States, 4,500 kilometers, to pick up a new accessible van that she had ordered. After her first long 10-hour day of driving, she checked into a hotel that she'd booked a week before leaving on her trip because it said it was wheelchair accessible. However, when she got to her room, she ran into a few problems. The shower in the room was not rolling accessible for her in her wheelchair so she had to go without a shower. The bed in the room was also too high for her wheelchair to get into, so she had to sleep in her wheelchair that night. Her room was not accessible. On the start of her next day of traveling, she called the next hotel to make sure the hotel did, in fact, have a bed that was low enough and a roll-in accessible shower in her wheelchair accessible room. She was guaranteed over the phone that the room had both. So after another long day of driving, she checked into that hotel and headed for her room. But the elevator wasn't working. There was no way for her wheelchair to climb stairs, and there were no rooms on the first floor of that hotel either. So at midnight, she was forced to find another hotel in town that had an accessible room, which, by the way, didn't have an accessible shower, so she had to go three days without a shower. Frustrating, right? As we're all travelers in this room, we all know how awful this must have been for her. Unfortunately, stories like these are common occurrences for many people with disabilities when they travel. Many of my friends with disabilities simply stay home and don't get out much because of the anxiety they have of the unknown. Being denied access to hotels, bathrooms, restaurants, you can pretty much name any type of public space 
and know that people with disabilities have been denied access to it at one time or the other. It's not only frustrating, but devastating. And I've heard hundreds of stories like this. But I truly hope that by educating people on the things they can do to help make our world more accessible and inclusive for people with disabilities, we can start to change that. Everyone should have access, and everyone should be included. My name is Alex Knoll. I'm 14 years old, and I'm the founder of a revolutionary, transformative new tool called Ability App. Ability App will help people with all types of disabilities find accessible public spaces, and find safe, reliable service, services and employment opportunities, transforming disability into ability, helping people like Emily find an accessible hotel room and other accessible spaces that help meet her specific needs to eliminate worry and frustration. Whether it's pinpointing a business that has braille menus for someone who's blind to use, or finding a business that has a quiet space for someone who has autism or noise sensitivities, Ability App will help people with disabilities lead more independent lives. I started developing Ability App five years ago when I was nine, after I saw a man in a wheelchair struggling to open a manual door at a store. I've had the opportunity to meet some incredible people uh, while in the process of developing Ability App, and my idea has been featured in many news outlets. I've also met some truly inspirational people, including Apple's Tim Cook and Ellen DeGeneres. Here's a short clip of my appearance on The Ellen DeGeneres Show. Hopefully, yeah. The app creator who had the sweetest reaction when we told him he was coming on the show. Take a look. Huh? Oh my gosh! <laughs> incredible. You're, you're amazing. I learned about you because you wrote in to the website and you told us about your app. Why did you write in? Well, you're just my hero. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. You're my hero and just thank you so much for having me on. This is, this is incredible. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so much. Well, all right, so tell people about, he's creating this, uh, this app uh, to help people with disabilities, which is the most amazing thing. Tell people what you're doing. Okay, well, Ability App will be a free app or website that will help people with disabilities navigate public spaces and find safe, reliable services and employment opportunities. <laughs> it's amazing. So, all right. So tell tell everybody why you wanted, how you had this idea. Okay. Well. It all started when I saw a man in a wheelchair, and he couldn't open a manual door. So I wondered if there was an app that could have told him what other stores around the area had automatic doors. So that day, I went home to do some research, and I couldn't find anything like Ability App, so I created it. So you, it's not like you had anyone in your family with, that you just saw a perfect stranger trying to get in a door, struggling, and you thought somebody should be able to look it up and find out where they could go. Unbelievable. Okay, so you have a prototype. Show everybody how you're going to try to get this thing to work. Okay. Well, this is the home page of Ability App. Okay. It shows all of the different businesses that you can select. So I'm going to click on hotels and travel. Okay. And the reason I'm going to do that is because, so hotels, when people, disabled people leave the comfort and safety and security of their own home, they don't know what obstacles they're going to face. And the hotels, they, they may say they're, they're rated accessible, but they're not truly functional to them. So Ability App will tell them what hotels meet their needs. So on Ability, or on Ability App, you can see, OK, this is a list of the different hotels that they can select. Um, so we'll click on this one, for example, if it, if it doesn't. OK, so it will show all of the disability-friendly features available. And it will show a description of the business and all of the contact information. And people will, um, will be able to write reviews on d the different businesses so, they, so people actually know if it's, if, if it's accessible for them. Right. Unbelievable. He's 12 years old, and he's doing this. <laughs> I need your help. Solving the problem of accessibility and inclusion for people with disabilities will take an extraordinary effort. 
But if we're going to solve this problem for a historically underserved population of people, we must start somewhere. I'm hoping that all of you here today will consider helping make our world more accessible and inclusive for the roughly one billion people out there living with some form of a disability. And I would very much love to bring Ability App to Europe, so if any of you see value in this idea and would like to learn more, I'd love to uh, have a di further discussion with you after the talk. So enough about the app. I'd like to talk to you about the why behind the app. So that brings me to the question, why are we here? I don't mean at this conference. I know you're here to grow and connect and learn. But why are we here as humans? It's a question mankind has been asking since the beginning. And while I don't intend to explain the meaning of life in five minutes, I do find it interesting that many thought leaders from around the world, from multiple religions and philosophies, have come to a similar conclusion that we're all here for each other. Why is a question most of us will ask throughout our lives. Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life will be the day you are born and the day you find out why. So why are you here? Do you know yet? And if we're all here for one another, how does that fit into the picture of your life? Are you living for others as much as you could be? If you look ahead to the end of your life, will you be able to say that you've made a difference in other people's lives? There are several reasons you might want to continue to help others. For starters, making life easier for someone else feels good. It provides us with purpose. And researchers have discovered that giving may even help improve our physical health. These are all good reasons why you should give to others, but are they your why? Every single one of us wants at our core the same thing in life. That's to belong, to feel accepted, valued, validated. From the clothes we wear to the cars we drive, that's all what we're trying to do, belong. But for some of us, the world is constantly telling us we don't. I'd like you all to help me with a little experiment. Let's dim the lights if possible. <laughs> if not, that's all right. I'd like to ask you to close your eyes. And now, with your eyes closed, I'd like you to imagine that you're blind. No mental pictures, just darkness. Your heightened sense of touch, sound, and smell are now your tools for navigating the world. Now imagine you're at a restaurant alone and you need to use the restroom, but there's no braille sign letting you know which restroom is for which gender. What do you do? Now imagine you're at home and you need to go to the grocery store, but it's snowing outside and you can't navigate the sidewalks because they haven't been shoveled. What do you do? It's pretty, it's pretty hard to be independent with these barriers. Okay, you can open your eyes. What did it feel like to experience the world for, from a different perspective? You imagine being blind for a few seconds, but for many people, that's a very real challenge every second of their life. And the digital world is no different. Websites and social media aren't accessible for many people with vision and hearing impairments. When you create a digital product, like a website or native app, Think, you'd think about making the digital space accessible to users with disabilities. Globally, it is estimated that approximately 1.3 billion people live with some form of a vision impairment. Over 36 million people are blind. Over 5% of the world's population has disabling hearing loss, which totals over 360 million people across the globe. Remember to caption your videos and posts on social media. Captioning videos will help people with hearing impairments fully understand your message. Captioning posts for people who are blind is just as important because your descriptions will help re have their uh, screen readers read your image captions aloud. Making the digital space accessible to users with disabilities is not only good for business, it's the right thing to do. People often ask me, why do you do it? Why spend all this time traveling around the world trying to make a difference for, for people you'll likely never meet? And here's what I tell them. This family is why. So they can take a vacation in a town they've never visited before to minimize worry and frustration by using Ability App to pinpoint something as simple as an accessible restroom or park trail. This young man is why. So he can find an accessible playground and have the ability to play like anyone else. My friend Greg is why. 
so we can find services at restaurants like Braille menus, service animal relief areas, and other disability-friendly features that help him along his journey. My friend Tara is why, so she can find services uh, and, and hotels that accommodate her unique needs, so she can live a more independent life. And the other roughly 1.14 billion people in the world struggling to do things the rest of us take for granted is why. But my why doesn't need to be your why. I'd like to challenge you from today on to see others like you've never seen them before, to view the world through the eyes of those in need, to find your why, to learn where your strengths and your passions intersect, and put forth that energy into the world that makes life a little better for everyone. If you have healthy eyesight, be the eyes for someone who can't see. If you have more time, more money, more resources, help those who have less. Maybe your passion is providing clean water to the two billion people in the world that don't have it. Or maybe it's just giving an elderly widow a ride to the park so she can feed the ducks like she used to with her husband. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to do something for someone else. If everyone did, imagine how much better the world would be. Now let's wrap up this evening's conversation and refocus our attention on how we might bring positive social change and positive economic results together as we enter a new era of leadership. An era that will force all of us as leaders to reinvent the way that we are currently leading our companies and uh, countries. Today's leaders really must incorporate social goals into their company alongside their economic goals. We must look beyond just basic profits and start creating a positive uh, culture of social change. A couple of quick questions for you all. Raise your hand if you have donated time or money to social causes this year or last year. That's wonderful. Now raise your hand if you think you have given enough to social causes. And I, as you can see by the difference in reactions, this is something that needs to be addressed. What can we give? our resources, our network, and our skills to narrow this gap. What is our company's mission? Are we just here to make a profit, or are we also looking to create positive social change in the world? Committing your business to, ph to philanthropy creates a vision for your company beyond turning a profit. Corporate donations allow companies to take interest into their own communities. It can also lead to a huge increase in employee morale. Giving back to the community that helped facilitate your success is a great thing to do. It's also important to note that a large percentage of today's consumers look to support corporations that are creating a positive social impact in the world. Philanthropic businesses are some of the most powerful in the world. For example, Apple matches employee charitable donations and has donated millions to charities. Charitable sponsorship is a great way to do good in your community while also gaining positive brand awareness. Donations put your company's name out there, especially if you sponsor an event or organization that mirrors your company's values. In closing, I ask you to continue to transform and elevate the lives of others through your business and policy making. I encourage you to find your why, to learn where your strengths and your passions intersect and put forth that energy into the world that makes life a little better for everyone. And you'll be closer to understanding why you're here. Thank you. And I'm still blown away by the fact that you're just 14, and oh, if I'm you. doing a quiz around, I wondering how many people remember what they did when they were 14, and if any of you was actually <laughs> tackling the greater good of over one billion people. So we'll open, we have two floor, two mics. Yes. Um, do you guys have, grab a chair. Okay, Stay great. in the middle, oh, yes. please. Okay. I'll just join you here. We have about eight minutes, um, and then we will move into the other session. So now it's your chance to, to get, uh, to, to find out from Alex more. And before you get to your questions, I do have a question. Yes. What's the status of the app right now? Um, how many countries do you cover? How, how is it uh, structured? If you can give us some more information about yes. it. Yes. Well, right now, we're beta testing the ability app in the United States uh, with a smaller group of people before we release it to the general public. And like I mentioned, I'd love to bring ability app to Europe. I think it has huge potential here. And there are, I mean, obviously, so many people that 
uh, that could use this on a daily basis. Um, so right now we're just getting the final touches worked out on the development side, uh, getting that beta testing finished up, and then we are going to launch in, uh, worldwide. The app is available worldwide right now. All you have to do is just kind of have a passcode for the, for the beta testing. Every business that is already on Apple Maps is already listed on Ability App. So all you have to do is search for business, take a photo, write an accessibility review. Uh, that's all you have to do. So all we have to do really left is, is to release it to the general public. So that's what, we, what we're on right now. Okay, are you still looking for investment? Yes, absolutely. Uh, finishing up the, the development and, and the servers, uh, being able to, to have the app sustain itself when it's finished. The app uh, has a revenue model to keep itself up and running uh, with ad space. But before we launch it, uh, we want to make sure that the app can still be up and running with the servers. There's ongoing engineering costs. So absolutely, that is a huge uh, need for a, for a tool that will be on a global scale like this. So if there is any business angel in the room um, after this session, uh, you can approach Alex directly. <laughs> um, and maybe one more meta question mm -hmm. or what type of challenges did you face for the past years while you put this idea into practice? What were the greatest challenges that you, you did face? Yes, well, throughout the process, uh, it's, I, I started developing the app, like I said, five years ago when I was nine. Um, the, big, the biggest challenge has been finding uh, talent for engineering uh, and, and the, the funding. An app like this, when we're when we're in the early when we were in the early stages, it was hard to find funding and be able to pay such uh, an expensive talent. Uh, engineers, computer scientists, that's a very expensive field to go into. Uh, so to hire somebody full time on a, on an app like this is very expensive. So throughout the past five years, that is, the funding side has probably been the, the biggest challenge uh, throughout the process. You have been uh, homeschooled for the past mm -hmm. three, four years? Yeah. But, and yeah. now you started high school? Yes. How is this transition working for you combined with the time that you need to put into the Ability app? Yes, well, I think it works out well, being able to get work done on the app and do school work as well. I'm really enjoying my time back at public school. I think it, it would be good to, to finish high school along, alongside working on the app and getting that finished. We're very close, so uh, it works out well. I'm really enjoying school. And what, that's good, that's good to hear. What <laughs> happens after you finish high school? What are your plans? Yes, well, hopefully, I, I, th I think app, the app will be done, Ability app will be released, and I, I would hope that it's helping people all over the world. So, uh, so after that, that's, that well, that's my goal for now. I'm not really sure what I want to do after, maybe go to college, but I, my goal right now is to see the app through and see it uh, being used worldwide by people and, and having it help them on a daily basis. That's fantastic. So uh, we have a question in the back. Thank you. My name is Jan from Globsec. Uh, Alex, I would like to ask you, what would be your message for people who have innovative ideas but are looking for the courage to act on them. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. I think that uh, one of the, the best aspects of getting something done like that is the power of positive thinking. That's one of the just the smaller aspects, but it really does make a difference. You do have the power to do whatever you want to do. If you have a business that you want to start, if you want to go into that field, you can absolutely do it. And if people tell you you can or, or just bring you down, don't listen. Uh, Follow your heart and whatever you want to do, you have the power to do it. So just keep going. If you have an idea, you can definitely succeed with all the tools that are available now in this modern world. We do have a question here. Need a mic. And a question in the back. Alex, you're an amazing presenter. Congrats. And well, thank uh, you. on having the courage to, to see this through. My question is uh, you must have lost challenges right now with, with the app. Uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think right now, uh, getting getting ready for, for the release to the general public, there are a lot of challenges uh, being faced with such a large potential audience. Like I said, the servers will be a huge huge need to, to pay for, for those with a large potential audience. It can get very expensive with so many people using it simultaneously and, and the constant uh, updating through the programming, having a, a full-time engineer preferably several for, for a, a, a company that has such a large um, user base, potentially. So just those, those kind of maintaining 
uh, aspects of when the app will be released to the public. So that's just the main challenge right now is, is figuring out uh, the, the, what we're going to do when that, when that day comes. We have a question in the back. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Lubica Karvashova, Slovak uh, Permanent Representation in Brussels. Uh, very inspirational, bravo. Thank you. I think the most far, the most inspirational uh, out of the speakers we've had. Oh. Don't, don't share oh, that no. outside this room. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I had a question after being in the US uh, like a year ago or two years ago. Uh, we had uh, a meeting with a deaf blind, <laughs> deaf blind person. Um, which struggles uh, along the way, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, does this, and well, basically the equipment or the facilities in the US uh, varies. I mean, somewhere they're developed for people who have some uh, difficulties and some other places they're not. I don't know what the status is in Europe. It also varies, I guess, a lot uh, mm -hmm. across the countries. Uh, I would say Slovakia is, is not on, on the top of, of the list of, of being very favorable to, to people with difficulties, but that's just very uh, subjective uh, view. Mm -hmm. Do you think this app could have a potential to somehow even help to develop facilities that are needed? Because I assume that's the basis that with which you have to work, that you first need to have places which provide uh, such a, such an environment which would be suitable for people. Do you think, or do you have reactions, feedbacks from companies or hotels or mm -hmm. anyone that is actually getting inspired by, by your own app? That yes. could be an interesting uh, secondary effect to, to what you're doing, but Absol uh, congratulations. Abs oh, thank you, absolutely. Well, uh, the, the, the two main goals of the app is to create a roadmap for people with disabilities and point out all of the accessible businesses for people with disabilities. That's been the main goal of the app. And also a secondary goal going alongside of that is educating businesses. Already uh, people are starting to learn more about accessibility and see how they can help. But just educating businesses even on the small things they can do to make their business more accessible. So people are really opening their eyes now, and I think this app will be a huge help uh, in getting people uh, realized. I mean, uh, so many people are good people, um, but they might not realize the struggles that people with disabilities face. So just opening their eyes and, and listening to people uh, can really help and, and get them aware of uh, the things they can do. We have one last question here in the front. Hi, Alex. Uh, I'm also Roger from Globesec, a fellow North American. Uh, I just wanted to return back to your message of sort of uh, individual positivity, which is desperately needed, I think, uh, on both sides of the continent right now. Are you convinced uh, long term of the ability for people to displace government as the main problem solvers? I mean, what you're doing presumably should have been solved by governments. Uh, so do you think after you solve, you know, this ability issue, do you think, you know, in 10, 15 years from now, the next Alex Knoll, uh, you know, is, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good trend moving forward versus, you know, government involvement uh, in society? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it's great to have a balance, um, having a private uh, people and normal citizens working on issues like this and having a government support those people. So I think it's, it's great to have a balance and that, that will definitely be needed. So any help that, that people could do with any problem in the world, just picking a problem and finding a solution, that's, that's all you have to do. So having both be, in, both be involved would be amazing in the future. I think that, that both uh, parties are really, they're, they're opening their eyes, especially in today with all the issues um, on how they can make a difference. So I think both would, it, it's awesome to have both collaborate and solve these problems together. I think my bottom line after this session is that competitiveness cannot exist without inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about more than one billion people around the world, we talk about substantial percentages of our GDP growth that are just lost because our lack of awareness mm -hmm. and our lack of facilities uh, to have uh, people with disabilities involved in our workforce. With that, I welcome, uh, I ask you to welcome to join me in um, um, saying congratulations, Alex, for all your work. Oh. Keep up the good work, and thank you for being with us. At thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Thank you.